LinkedIn presents. Fundamentally, even though there's a really complex and fragmented landscape, I think for storytellers and for business builders, it's just a real fundamental basic challenge is what does value creation look like in this ecosystem? How do you provide ultimate value to the person on the other side, understanding that they have a lot to choose from? And there is a a finite amount of time and attention that we're fighting for. And that's when individuality, authenticity, true connection and experience still rise to the top. So with all of this noise, ultimately, we pay attention to the same things that we've always paid attention to, things that have meaning for us and value for us. That was the co-founder and former CEO of Heartbeat, media executive, entrepreneur and all around builder, Ty Randolph. And in this episode, Ty and I discuss what it's like to build a media company in today's environment. We talk about what it means to be a creator and the impact of generative AI on the creative process. We also discuss what it was like to raise one of the largest rounds of funding ever raised from private equity by a black woman CEO. And we'll be right back with that conversation after a brief word from our sponsor. The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by Oracle. AI may be the most important new computer technology ever. Do more and spend less like some of the world's most successful companies. Take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash LinkedIn Podcast Network. Hey, everyone. Welcome to LinkedIn Presents Redefining Work Podcast. I'm your host, Lars Schmidt. And today, I'm really excited to be joined by Ty Randolph. Ty is a award-winning executive entrepreneur, producer. You've got a lot of things that you've done in your background, and I'm excited to get into all of that. So let's kind of I'll turn it over to you. What would you like for the audience to know about you before we jump into your background? Well, thanks for the intro. Super excited to be chatting today. Uh, I mean, that was a great lead in, right? I have had now a career that has spanned two decades, which is wild to say. (laughs) And it's really been a mix of, of all of the above, right? I spent the first part of my career in advertising at WPP and publicist shops. In fact, before WPP or Publicis, my first job out of college was working at a UK-based uh, marketing firm where all of our clients were aerospace and telecom and defense. And then, you know, I got into some of the big hold codes. And then the middle chapter was more about technology at Sony and Meta when it was Facebook. And for the past seven years, I've been out in LA really focused on entertainment. Most recently, I was CEO, co-founder and board member at, you know, Kevin Hart's Heartbeat a global media and entertainment company dedicated to keeping the world laughing. And uh, yeah, I always talk about my career as more of a river than a ladder. And so really excited to to delve into all things redefining work today. Yeah. Well, I love the river analogy. And actually, I often use like a lattice over a ladder, but I kind of like river better because it does, you know, it it signifies the ebbs and flows and the detours. And I want to talk about that for a little bit because you walked us through, obviously you've worked in different sectors, you've worked in different roles, you've been in marketing and technology, you've been a builder, you've worn a lot of different hats. And I'm always curious, especially for people like you that have had different, you've kind of reinvented yourself several times over. How intentional was that, right? Like looking back, I think you could always like today, looking back, you can probably, you know, draw the line and it might, it won't be a straight line, but you can probably connect the dots of like, okay, this became this and that led to this. But like for some people it's, they operate in short term increments where they're like, Hey, I'm planning for the next year, maybe two years. I tend to operate that way for other people. It's like they had a plan and they had a vision and it's a much longer tail vision. So how do you think about your own career when you look back and you look at the different things that you've done that have led you to this point today? Absolutely. You know, one of the reasons I use that analogy river over ladder is because, you know, there are a lot of parallels. So every river has a source. Often it could be a small spring. 
And so much of where my career has taken me has been about, you know, really early influences. And I grew up on a farm in South Carolina, and there's something, you know, really entrepreneurial (laughs) about that when you witness, you know, my my dad and my uncles and and family kind of living off the land and building as they went, you know, and and also there's something inherently scrappy about that. And so I think my approach was informed um, by much of those early experiences. Uh, In college, I really grappled with whether, you know, I would go down this path of being a corporate lawyer or a journalist or a filmmaker. Uh, I ended up being a comms major. But interestingly enough, all the reasons why I considered those different paths have played out over the course of the career, in my career. Deal making, narrative building, a deep curiosity in understanding how things work. Um, You know, and then I think I'm the oldest child of seven. And so I think there's something that's a natural administrator in in, in taking that, (laughs) a blended family of seven. And so, you know, all of those things really informed the curiosity and and what I pursued. And then much like a river, it is meandering. And sometimes you end up in these bins that you don't expect. There's so many serendipitous moments in my career where, you know, I remember one that was really interesting. I used to work, um, I was at VML and there was a gentleman who worked for me who was leaving the company and he had introduced me on an email without really any context to a former boss of his and the former boss worked at Sony. And I think the email said something like, you have been two of my best bosses and you should meet. (laughs) It was very much the type of email that he would send. And he was wonderful, but I didn't always understand like, you know, how he connected the dots. (laughs) But really brilliant and insightful because we ended up exchanging notes about this, you know, email that, that didn't necessarily, well, how did we end up introduced? Turns out, you know, his former boss was on 55 in Madison at Sony. I was on 41 in Madison. We agreed to meet for lunch. And that really led to the exploration of me, you know, leaving that role to go, you know, partner with him. He was the the head of the digital business group over at Sony Music at the time. And he had a really interesting point of view on how he wanted to build out what at the time was a proprietary e-commerce platform. And I ended up joining and, and eventually doing a management buyout of that platform. And I ended up joining that company as uh, VP of Consumer Marketing and, and grew and helped scale it and helped carve it out. Uh, but it's one of those things you wouldn't have expected. So I couldn't have, you yeah. know, that wasn't on my bingo card. And that's much of the latter. And then, you know, rivers, sometimes they're fast and sometimes they're slow. They ebb and they flow. And I think embracing that type of fluidity has really kept me open to, to new ideas and new experiences. And so to your point, when I look back at it, the narrative and the theme has been um, at my core, I'm a storyteller and a, and a builder. And that's taken lots of different, um, you know, manifestations over the course of the last several years. Yeah. Well, I want to key on that builder aspect of your background for a moment, because, you know, one of, in your most recent role as you know, co-founder and CEO of Heartbeat, you led one of the largest private equity raises, especially for a Black CEO woman yeah. in business. And I would love to just learn more about that process you know, for you and you uh, a bit more context as well as kind of bringing the two different platforms together with Kevin Hart. But I would love to just learn more about your insights, fundraising, having those conversations, raising funds for, again, this kind of, you know, comedic force in the industry. And I'd love to just get an inside view of what that experience was like for you. Yeah. You know, I talk about just the arc of careers. When I started working with Kevin, it was actually the Alliance Gate who, you know, I first became acquainted with, with our work at Sony because they ended up being a client on the platform that we were working on. And I went to Facebook and then I ended up, um, you know, somehow back, (laughs) um, you know, with this former client of mine as they were um, taking this new platform to market, uh, Laugh Out Loud, it was the streaming service at the time. And it was a joint venture with Kevin. And so it started out as a 50-50 joint venture that was completely operationalized within Lionsgate. Um, as Lionsgate's director of consumer strategy evolved and as, you know, the vision that we had for the company evolved, we ended up architecting a deal to buy out the majority of Lionsgate's interest. We went external or, or more independent, brought on Comcast as a minority investor for Laugh Out Loud. And then I think in about 2020, Kevin asked me to extend my role as COO, because the COO of Laugh Out Loud then to his other venture, Harpy Productions. And so it was in the middle of 2021 during the pandemic 
that we decided to merge those two ventures. And so I spent the back half of 2021 merging the two companies and the company, both companies profitable, growing at, you know, an amazing clip. And really there was a bigger, you know, sort of one plus one equal, you know, perhaps a billion or more proposition in the merger of these two. And so I spent the back half of the year merging those two companies. I became the CEO of the newly formed company, January 1, 2022, April of that year, closed the capital raise, the $100 million growth equity infusion from Avery Partners. And I share that context because my experience getting to the point of, of raising capital and entering the PE space wasn't traditional. I don't have a, a, an MBA. I don't have a law degree. And I was this homegrown CEO who had you know, entered this company as SVP of marketing, had gone from SVP of marketing to uh, SVP of marketing and monetization, then EVP and GM, and then spent two years at that post. And I, I, I left the company in uh, November 2020. Maybe my math is wrong. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's still post-COVID calculations. You know, so when going through that process in the private equity space, there weren't so many folks who did not have my background, right? Most of the folks who I encountered, you know, were had come to the CEO path differently. Many of them had MBAs and many of them did not look like me from a gender and, you know, sort of an ethnicity perspective, a gender and race perspective. And so while that doesn't seem significant, what you find is that you end up in these rooms and on these calls and no one looks like you. And I personally found myself, you know, really questioning, you know, your your competency or your, you know, the of the appropriateness of yourself in, in some of those spaces. And during the process is really when I, I fundamentally realized and something that I now try to evangelize is my experience as an operator, my deep understanding of the business, the fact that I had, you know, built it from the ground up made me uniquely qualified <laughs> to do so. And I think often when we look at the process and it's so daunting, whether it's the, you know, taxonomy and the language around fundraising, because it's a whole different <laughs> yeah. regular, or the networking around it and understanding the steps in the process, um, it can be a really intimidating and daunting, you know, endeavor. And that's even when you're flanked by a, you know, a powerhouse like, like Kevin, and after going through that process, I thought one was really proud of myself and the team, but it also made me deeply empathetic to other, you know, sort of female founders and fundraisers and people of color who are looking to, you know, pursue capital for their businesses, because I thought that was really a hard process. And if it was that hard for me with this resource, with these resources and this track record and these connections, imagine, you know, that, that barrier and, the numbers are pretty wild. I think even if you can sort of broaden the aperture and you look at how many women are CEOs of PE back companies, it's less than 10%. And if you look at the number, and this was, I think these stats were in 2022, so hopefully they've improved, but unfortunately not dramatically. There were only, there were under 100 women, black women who had raised over a million dollars in the VC space. I mean, those are just super sad statistics. Sometimes I think we can be deceived by all of the diversity programs and initiatives, but from a pure stats and facts perspective, there's still a huge disparity that's rooted in pattern matching, that's rooted in access, that's rooted in, that's rooted in pipeline. And, you know, so I'm deeply committed moving forward to doing everything that I can to, you know, help break down some of those walls. People have always been the key to unlocking business performance. Never has that been more true than today. I'm Lars Schmidt, and this is the Redefining Work podcast. In each episode, we speak with business leaders who are influencing modern work and people practices. This podcast is your key to understanding the link between business performance and progressive people strategies. And if you're a people leader wanting to have an impact on your business, I encourage you to join our community for progressive people leaders at amplifytalent.com slash community. This community is unlike anything you've experienced before. Want more direct insight? Here are some words from community members, Chloe Sesta Jacobs, Noah Warder, and Balbina Knight. The caliber of humans that I have met in this group is like nothing I've experienced before. It is truly the safest community I've ever been a part of. One of the things I love so much about the Amplified community is having the opportunity to connect with a global group of peers. And if you're a business leader on the market for a transformative people leader, be sure to check out our HR executive search services at AmplifyTalent.com. Now, on to the show. 
I mean, so many, and I appreciate that context. And so much of what you're navigating are systems, right? That have been built. You mentioned pattern matching. I mean, you mentioned the you know demographics of typically the people in those rooms and in those meetings. How do we disrupt that, right? How do we kind of make make an easier on ramp and access to capital to capital? for underrepresented leaders who have great ideas, have great businesses, have great operational backgrounds, but again, purely from a pattern matching standpoint or a like standpoint, may not have access in the same way. I think the first thing to do is acknowledgement. And I used to say it was around acknowledging implicit bias, but actually even that feels there's blame in, in even implicit bias. No one wants to be biased. No one wants to think of themselves as prejudiced. So, you know, the first step to solving a problem is admitting that you have one. Then, you know, when you point the finger in, in someone's face that way, it's really difficult for someone to raise their hand and say, I'm guilty of that. But if we would all acknowledge affinity bias, right, like attracts like, we all know we, you know, operate in in communities and tribes of folks that we have some interest with, some similarities to. And so if we acknowledge affinity bias and that's not if if that's not an inherently bad thing, if that's just a human thing, I think it opens up the way or opens up the pathway to say, okay, well, like now I need to be very deliberate about considering ideas people outside of my normal consideration set or outside of this, you know, sort of very closed, you know, tribe or environment. And the other piece is that, you know, I think we have to be more imaginative. And this idea that if, if you know, a, a project, if an opportunity doesn't come packaged in the same wrapping, and that could be a number of things, right? You know, whether that's sort of runway or track record or composition of the founding team, I, I think that's going to be really difficult, even in being, you know, a becoming a CEO, if you only put someone in that spot who has had that experience, then you are ultimately never going to, you know, that's a a natural or fixed barrier that will keep the door closed and, and keep the circle so small. The other thing it does is it really inhibits innovation. And, you know, I'm encouraged by trends and the opportunity with access that exist with emerging technologies and with the rise of generative AI, it, you know, there's a promise or a potential for it to be a great equalizer in, in terms of access and a great scaler in terms of how, you know, folks can enter and build and scale businesses without necessarily having to have to have the same amount of resources. However, I am equally as concerned about the same type of pattern matching that's happening with the investment that's going on, you know, in AI during the dot com boom, all of the investment was concentrated with, you know, a certain profile of founder. And those people came to to rise and rule the internet and, and ultimately businesses we know it. And Unfortunately, while, again, there's this huge access, democratization of access to the tools with AI, there is still a, probably even a more hyper concentration of the investment in a particular profile of founder with a particular type of network, with a particular type of background. And from that perspective, there is a potential to, to create, you know, an even greater divide and a greater disparity, you know, in, in terms of the composition of future founders who are funded for scale. The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by TIAA. In the last 100 years, we've seen financial markets swing, new currencies come and go, decades of savings lost in days, all showing that a retirement plan without a guarantee, quite simply, isn't enough. So more than a retirement plan, TIAA makes you a retirement promise, a promise of a guaranteed retirement paycheck for life, a promise that pays off. Learn more at TIAA.org backslash promises pay off. Hey, I'm Michael Kovnat, host of the Next Big Idea Daily. The show is a masterclass in better living from some of the smartest writers around. Every morning, Monday through Friday, we'll serve up a quick 10-minute lesson on how to strengthen your relationships, supercharge your creativity, boost your productivity, and more. Follow the Next Big Idea Daily wherever you get your podcasts. I mean, that's such a great point. I think that when you look at kind of how these LLMs are trained and how they're set up, I mean, they're trained on existing data that is already biased. And so if they're not intentionally kind of de-biased as they're developed, and obviously, you know, 
there's examples of that that have gone right. There's examples of that that have gone wrong, like Google's, you know, Gemini, you know, rollout earlier this year. So I guess last year now, since we're recording this in 2024, but I'd love to actually spend a few moments on AI because you have a really interesting kind of dual, I imagine, perspective on AI. On the one side, you are close to creators. I mean, I think there's a natural skepticism or concern that creators may have towards AI, particularly around things like copyright and, you know, uh, work product that these models are trained on, but you're also a business executive. And I'm sure through that lens, you see lots of opportunities in AI as there is. So how do you, how do you think about AI, both as somebody who is kind of close to the creator space, but also somebody who is a business leader thinking about how to leverage these tools? I think about AI the same way I think about humans, right? <laughs> I don't think that hum any human being is inherently good or bad, but I do think that every human being has an unlimited capacity for good or evil. And that's not absolute. That is often circumstantial and it depends on the, you know, conditions and, you know, how that human was reared and, you know, the environments and how they ended up making choices. And so there's an analogy that could really play out there. And I think with AI, there's an unlimited capacity for good and evil in the entertainment industry and everywhere else. And so, but what I would encourage creators to do, though, is to lean into that. If something is daunting, and that doesn't mean, you know, throw caution to the wind as it pertains to, you know, intellectual property and, you know, all of the really complex frameworks around rights and particularly around NIL and the creative process at all. But I am saying that if, you know, if, if we want, if, if storytellers, if, if we have great concern that we should have great investment in ensuring that we have a seat at the table and how the technology evolves and how it's governed. And you saw a lot of that play out in terms of, you know, the initial uh, attempts to protect creatives and the creative process, you know, during the strikes, but the technology isn't going to slow down. And so I encourage everyone to really lean in. There are certain challenges that the industry has faced um, th that would really cause us to embrace AI when it comes to efficiency and process and being able to scale productions and doing it more effectively when the entire industry has really placed from a content acquisition and ROI perspective, a much greater focus on budgets and efficiency. But even Sam Altman has said that in this new era of AI, is generative AI scale, some of the most important skills that we as humans can continue to evolve are critical thinking and creativity and our ability to curate. And that is the artist's playground. You know, the AI will never have the experience that a human does in the world. They will never have the diverse perspective, the ability to connect with and anticipate what other people feel and think. And so then in that environment, there is a premium placed on creativity, the ability to be able to ask the right questions and to architect delightful, unexpected outcomes. The promise of, of generative AI is around scale and possibility, but we understand that can create a sea of sameness. And so, you know, I think it's about really walking that line in that intersection. Yeah. You know, I'm curious, you mentioned Sam Altman. When you first saw some of the videos being created by Sora, when they demoed that, what was your initial response as you kind of saw how some of those things came together? Yeah, you know, the initial response was obviously, right, this is, this doesn't come close to the work of, you know, the artists that, you know, that we work alongside um, in the field every day. But it was also, wow, if this is the earliest iteration, imagine where this is going to go. Right. <laughs> and so, you know, I think we're all looking back and realizing that these tools are only going to become smarter and better. And so, you know, how we regulate them, how we ensure the, the responsible use of them over time and how we lean into really driving the creative output and informing how, you know, humans collaborate and wield these tools because, you know, that's ultimately what they are, tools, is critical. And so, like I said, any artist who I'm talking to, any executive who I'm speaking to, it, it is really this encouragement to lean in and explore and be curious. And by the way, and absolutely be cautious and absolutely be concerned. And because of that concern is, you know, the number one reason why we all have to be deeply involved. This will be a much greater technological revolution, a much greater business revolution, than anything we've seen in our lifetime. And it's not over time, it's happening in real time. And so, you know, the action is.
So that's kind of the exciting and scary, perhaps, aspect of this. I mean, I'm a I'm an optimist and I'm a technologist. So for me, I kind of look at this and I see a lot of opportunities, but there are risks. And and the point you just made, I think, is so important that you know you look at th this is probably the most you know significant thing that we've encountered since personal computing and the internet. You know, arguably bigger, but also when you look at how that scaled, right? I mean, you know, we had AOL dial-up disks and, you know, we we're using our landlines to get on the internet and it was super slow and there was no widespread mobile device. And look at how far we've come in the last 20 years. And, you know, ChatGPT was released to the public in November, 2022. And we're already at this place now. And obviously that's just one LLM. There, there are many where the pace that this change is happening is so fast. And I want to actually connect that to something that I know you're passionate about, which is you have AI and that is driving a wave of content, AI generated content. And you can comment on, you know, how, you know, human or interesting or good that may be. There's both sides of that, you know, equation, but you also have all of these, you know, digital platforms that even 10 years ago, we didn't. And so at an individual level, you know, when they talk about kind of creators now and storytellers, you have instant global distribution. You have instant access to tools that will allow you to edit video in creative ways or create content or images in different ways. So the, the distribution is there and it's frictionless. The mediums and the platforms are there and they're frictionless. And so how do you stand out in that environment as a storyteller, right? Where you have just so much content that you have to rise above to really connect with an audience. Going back to the first part of what you said, the fundamental thing that we all, I believe, as learners, as workers, as builders have to realize is the, and wrap our minds <laughs> and our processes around, is how the innovation clip has accelerated, right? Because to your point, we just had, as humans and as learners, a much longer time to digest and adapt uh, and get up to speed with things. And now I think we all have to figure out different ways and means of learning and how to learn at a clip and, you know, assess and process information at a clip that is accelerated just because of how fast things are moving. And so what does that mean for storytellers? Well, a couple of things to your point. That means everyone's a storyteller. And that's always been true, right? From the dawn of civilization, we, you know, story is so fundamental to the human experience. It's how we connect. It's how we, you know, sort of maintain history and how we advance our ourselves and our ideas through time. So we're, we've all always been storytellers. Our ability to be able to scale stories individuals, that level of reach, that level of creativity was really, you know, insulated to a, a number of really powerful organizations and, and powerful celebrities. And now with not just the rise of the creator economy and, and the vast expansion of the creator economy, uh, but just this, you know, mass empowerment of everyday storytellers and individuals across every different platform, we're all competing with everything all the time. And I would remind, you know, myself and my teams that even, you know, in entertainment companies, a lot of times you think, well, what else is being released in the theater during this time? Or what else is streaming during this time? But in an intention economy where we're constantly, you know, fluidly moving between devices and experiences and having them at the same time <laughs> with, with these co-viewing and, and co-experiential opportunities, then, you know, you're competing with what's on your television and what's in your earbud and, you know, what someone's seeing on a billboard and, and, or, and via goggles all at the same time. And, and by the way, to be deeply interesting and to gain attention, it doesn't have to be very expensive. Um, it doesn't even have to be very prolific, but what it does have to do is provide value to that consumer at that moment in time. And so fundamentally, even though there's a really complex and fragmented landscape, I think for storytellers and for business builders, it's just a real fundamental basic challenge is what does value creation look like in this ecosystem? How do you provide ultimate value to the person on the other side, understanding that they have a lot to choose from and there is a, a finite amount of time and attention that we're fighting for. And that's when individuality, authenticity, true connection and experience still rise to the top. So with all of this noise, 
ultimately we pay attention to the same things that we've always paid attention to, things that have meaning for us and value for us. No, I, I appreciate that context. And I think your point around the kind of attention economy is so spot on, right? Because we're just, we're flooded with content on every platform, on every channel at all times. I think it's more rare to be disconnected than to be connected, right? And so that's just the reality that we live in today. Absolutely. Um, one thing I'd love to get your perspective on. So a friend of mine, Minda Hartz, is a, an aspiring uh, screenwriter. She's an author. She's a published author. She's done many books and talks and is now beginning to kind of try to make that segue into screenwriting. And, you know, she was curious to get your perspective on for somebody who hasn't kind of come up through entertainment, hasn't come up through media, does not have those networks, does not have access to, you know, the people that can usually, you know, accelerate having a script picked up or kind of giving feedback or mentorship. What advice would you have for somebody who's looking to break into the industry who is maybe moving into the field from somewhere else where they don't have that established kind of network or body of work specifically in that, in the entertainment space to bring with them? Sure. A couple of things. One, there are so many programs out there. You know, I talk about the sea of sameness. There's a need for um, a real hunger uh, for diverse perspectives, new voices that can really cut through. And there's so many more home from a, a, a more diverse chorus of voices and for new voices. That said, the systems really haven't evolved too much in terms of how you can get the idea heard in the traditional senses. So I would really encourage, though, there are a lot of pipeline programs. I mean, we, I co-founded a program called Women Right Now and it was at Heartbeat and it was all around amplifying, you know, diverse voices, particularly Black Black women in comedy in partnership with Sundance Institute and, and JPMC. And what was interesting, we launched that program. I was very deliberate in saying I wanted no barrier to entry. So there was no entry fees. And there were also, it was all writers. So we were very deliberate to say, if you were a copywriter or an aspiring screenwriter, or if you'd written something on a post-it one day, we want to hear from you. And often we would find, you know, when we got to those finalists, sure, there'd be some folks who came from film school and, you know, who had, you know, published something or, you know, there might be a journalist involved, but often these are just people who had really good ideas. And so there are a ton of those programs that are out there far more than, you know, say five or 10 years ago. So I would really lean into that. The other thing I would say, or you know, the two others, going back to this level of access and, you know, the creator economy, so often when, you know, you're getting so many submissions through the traditional process, whether it's through, you know, agents and managers and or programs for folks who aren't represented, it can be hard to, to kind of cut through as someone who's um, looking to acquire new content or looking to green light or looking to, to sort of identify new talent. And those digital platforms have been absolutely critical in terms of, you know, sending sound, you know, strong signals through all the noise. And there are so many incredible examples from Issa Rae, whose career, entire career, and all of the companies and the network that she, you know, has now deployed. And, and when I say network, I mean, these networks of company, creative companies that she's building, it started out as a web series <laughs> online that was then picked up and the popularity of the web series and that proof of concept, and I believe it was, you know, distributed on YouTube, translated to, you know, Insecure and then ultimately, you know, all of the IP and the opportunities that she's created since then. You know, Quinta Brunson, same, you know, scenario. She started out in BuzzFeed and, you know, doing skits online and now, you know, has one of the most successful network television shows in history. So I think the ability to get out and create and showcase your work via the mediums that you have and to build audience and for artists, you know, often we say, hey, we just want to get our work out there. But I would say it's very critical to understand how to build audience, even in, you know, relatively smaller ecosystems or frameworks, because as an artist in this particular distribution ecosystem, you're really going to need to understand how streamers and platforms think about audience if you want to get projects picked up. So if you can figure out how to do that in a grassroots perspective and get real time audience feedback, it's only going to make you more effective um, when you get in those rooms. And then the third and, and final piece of advice I would give is one piece of advice from my own experience. I talked about the transition from advertising into, you know, sort of this tech entertainment space with Sony. That happened because 
the first thing I did in, in tech and entertainment was the same function that I was doing in an advertising agency, right? So taking a function and applying it to an industry is a great way to, to change, to transition from a vertical perspective. So, you know, I was marketing and using emerging media and doing CRM and all of this stuff in an agency setting for CPG and retail brands. And then I took that same subject matter expertise and applied it to the entertainment vertical. And so think about those points of entry where you can use your existing skill set and all that knowledge base to get into the industry. So whatever, you know, her day job is at the moment, how could you leverage that to get into an entertainment company where now at least you're surrounded by, even if you're not writing full time, you know, folks who are like minded and you get the connectivity to be able to network within the industry, even if from a different angle. Yeah. Well, I love that feedback and you're taking us back to the river, <laughs> right? Is being able to kind of leverage those past skills. And I think, again, you're right. I think especially we're, we're seeing this interesting convergence of these different disciplines that historically had been kind of siloed and separate that are now coming together. And so there's this kind of real alchemy involved when you can bring di- different skills to different roles and maybe help them see the work in a different way. And that puts a lot of power in the hands of the individual. Of the, of the creator, of the writer, or whatever the role may be, of the business executive, right? It doesn't have to be a creative space. So it's such an interesting time. I, I really, I love learning more about your background and your experience. If the audience wants to kind of connect with you after the show, what's the best way for them to do that? Are there preferred social channels, website? What, what's the best way? I am Ty Randolph everywhere. I am tyrandolph.com, <laughs> Ty Randolph on LinkedIn, Ty Randolph on Instagram, T-H-A-I-R-A-N-D-O-L-P-H. All right. Well, Ty, thanks so much for your time. Uh, I'm excited to see how your work unfolds and what you do next. And I appreciate you giving us a window into your world. Thanks, Lars. This is so much fun. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of LinkedIn Presents Redefining Work. For more information on the podcast, past episodes, future guests, and more, be sure to check out our website at amplifytalent.com slash redefining dash work. And if you want to connect with me directly, you can find me on my website at LarsSchmidt.com or feel free to post on social using the hashtag redefining work and I will find you. And if you dig this podcast, I'd love for you to share it with your peers and your friends and help them discover it. And if you really dig this podcast, please leave a review on whatever podcast delivery your ears prefer. I'll see you next week.